Fly ball left field tagging from third is Suarez. Goodell comes running in. He's under it, makes the catch. Here's the throw to the plate. It's in the air. He is. And welcome back to the first of hopefully many uh, playoff editions of the Stupid Money Podcast. This one doesn't really include the Phillies too much. We're going to talk more about what we're going to see this week in the wild card round with that now set. Um, the Braves and the Mets split, which I think everyone expected to happen because the team that won game one was going to absolutely punt game two. And that was the case. The Mets win a crazy one in the first game. And then the Braves win. I mean, the Mets didn't show up to play at all. That game was, what, 3 nothing. It was very boring. Um, the Mets didn't threaten once, it felt like. So that was the case. Diamondbacks out, which I think a lot of Phillies fans feel good about, although I would say I think that team was struggling towards the end of the season. I think I would have rather see them in the bracket other than one of these, one or the two of the Mets and the Braves, because I think both of them are, surged a little bit I, the Mets have surged I think the Braves have been kind of the same team for most of the year but their pitching is a little concerning but the Phillies wouldn't have to worry about the Braves until the NLCS so let's focus on the Brewers and the Mets because that is the matchup that the winner of that will face the Phillies who finished as the two seed with 95 wins Dodgers got hot towards the end of the year got up to 98 so they get the one seed um, and then side note, the Phillies did get home field advantage over every team in the AL, which matters. So pretty much just the Dodgers, the only team that has it over them. Um, but uh, let's just open it right up. Braves or Mets, who'd you rather face? And let's get into it. <laughs> as far as the Mets or Braves for me, like on, on paper, if you kind of look at the rosters and everything, I'd probably rather face the Mets. I think if you look at the firepower, obviously out of the two teams, Lindor is the best player. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's particularly close. But as far as lineups go as a whole, I like Olsen kills the Phillies. Oh, yeah, all yeah, these yeah. Brewers, Brewers, not Braves. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, Brewers – then I'd rather pay the Brewers because I don't think that okay. offense has any juice or anything. I know we kind of talked about this going into the last week of the season, but like Hoskins is there, but he's hitting like sixth or seventh for them. I think he's towards the yeah. bottom of that lineup. Like they're going it, to, it's similar to the team that we saw last year with Arizona in the NLCS, but they don't have the Cattell Marte or, like Jackson Cheerio is kind of similar to Corbin Carroll in terms of like young, exciting, toolsy guy, but like they don't have that Cattell Marte that's at the top of that order that's going to hit, you know, like every game of the series, multiple hits, back breaking hits. Like Willie Adamas is very good for what he does offensively, but mm -hmm. he's he's kind of a different ball game than Cattell Marte in in terms of what he brings. So I like I really. I'd rather avoid the Mets right now um, with how they're kind of running. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be depleted pitching wise because they're going into a short series already shorthanded just because of what they had to do today. They threw, you know, two guys that threw in game one, they threw them again in game two. And that's, you know, on top of Edwin Diaz having thrown over 50 pitches before his 10 and 11 pitch ninth inning. Um, today, so he threw 60 pitches in the last two games. So, like, that's a lot for a closer, especially one that has, you know, came back off of injury this year. So they're going to be a little shorthanded, but they just have some sort of, you know, thing going on this year where they, you know, sign a shortstop who hasn't been, you know, particularly good, especially offensively lately, but throughout his career. And all of a sudden he's hitting, like, over 300 for them and dropping singles and performing post-game concerts afterwards while he's doing that. 
Um, you know, they had a McDonald's mascot revive their season, and they've been exceptionally hot since the London series when we saw them. Uh, all of a sudden, their pitchers are all, you know, pitching like aces, and we saw them a lot the last month, and we didn't do particularly well against them. Um, you know, you, you wonder how that translates to the playoffs where David Peterson's never been before. Sean Manaya has been there with the Padres, and we lit him up. Uh, in the NLCS that year. Severino has been there with the Yankees, and I don't have any stats to fact check this, but I feel like I just remember him starting a big wild card game against the Astros a few years ago, like maybe four or five years ago, and just being absolutely rocked in Yankee Stadium. Um, so I, I could be wrong in that, but I don't think he's like the best playoff pitcher ever. And like their bullpen outside of Diaz isn't great, and we did walk Diaz off this month. So, like, roster-wise, I'm not, like, particularly scared of either of these teams, but I'd just rather stay away from the Mets because of what, like, divisional implications lay there. And I think that they are slightly better than the Brewers team that they're going to be playing. Yeah, I mean, this Mets team has a lot of good juju, which matters just as much as talent this time of year. Um mm. And, that, you know, that worries me a little bit just because I think we kind of saw the Phillies feed off of that in 2022. So we saw it firsthand. And then we unfortunately kind of on the other end of it with the Diamondbacks last year. And then I think you could even make a pretty good case that the the Rangers were kind of in that same class, too, when they won the World Series last year. Um, so teams, you know, that just come on hot at the end and have all these good vibes are very dangerous. To me, the Brewers, I don't know, they're the same team every year, and their playoff result is about the same every year, too. <laughs> it's just like they're always there, but they're never actually a threat to win it all. I, I So I think I'd rather like face them. The back half of their bullpen petrifies me. I think yeah. they're a lot harder to beat than the Mets once you get to the seventh inning and later. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that's a pretty accurate thing to say. I just think the Mets might... Put up a few more runs early on, which could give you problems. Um, obviously, these are two teams that seen each other a lot, and we saw kind of with the Braves in the playoffs last two years, you could start to figure these guys out by the time October comes around, and the Phillies mashed on Braves pitchers that they struggled with against in the regular season. And, you know, that could be the opposite happen here now with these Mets guys if that was to be the case. So I think for a lot of reasons, I think I'd rather face the Brewers Um the only thing that I give them kind of the up on on the Mets right now is bullpen. I think offense, the Mets are better. I, pitching is pretty much a push, just kind of the way these Mets guys have overachieved this year. Now, like you said, I don't know if that translates to the playoffs, but it's kind of been there. And then I just think kind of overall, like how hot they are, the Mets are way above where the Brewers are. Um, the Brewers forever just been this ho-hum team that kind of runs through a really weak NL Central. I, I, I don't know. To me... I'd rather face the Brewers, so we'll see how this week goes. But the thing is, I think we face the Brewers because, as you mentioned, I, I don't see a realistic scenario where the the Mets can win game one tomorrow unless they scored eight or nine runs. Uh, it's just not going to happen with the amount of pitching they had to throw, honestly, all weekend and then twice on Monday. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because you're talking about, you know, what it was when we were facing pitch play I'd see and struggled with like the Mets did see the Brewers this weekend they were in Milwaukee Friday Saturday and Sunday and lost two of three um mm -hmm. I don't know who exactly pitched there for the Brewers because they kind of had everything locked up um there was the possibility that they were going to face the Mets so like obviously you're not shelving guys early uh for the most part but you know you'll probably come out there to get a few innings of work but like I don't know off the top of my head if they saw like the Freddie Peraltas. I know Colin Ray have pitched one game, but um, like they did just see them this weekend and didn't fare too well. And the offense was relatively quiet. So, you know, they're, they're going to have, the Mets are going to have to outslug the Brewers um, to win, it, you know, tomorrow or like they're, they're in a difficult spot because you obviously can't, game one after right, you know, this double game, be like, oh, 
well, we'll, we'll, you know, chalk this one up because we kind of got screwed by the schedule and then win the next two because that's a really difficult game to play, especially when you're a road team. But, like, watching the games last year in Milwaukee that Arizona played in the wild cards, um, like that, it it didn't seem like the craziest place in the world to go play a mm-hmm. game in terms of a playoff environment. And, like, sometimes, like, th- this happens in sports all the time. We've seen it in different events or different settings. But, like, there's always the thing where a team's kind of, like, too naive or too young to know any better. And sometimes, you know, things are just going well for a, a team and the Mets are relatively young. A lot of their pitching staff, at least were guys who got turned off um, kind of like outcasts or misfits. Like can, Jose Quintana is kind of on the last leg, probably didn't expect to get another multi-year deal. David Peterson, um, kind of a failed rookie, never a top prospect really. Manaya got cast aside. Um, Tyler McGill has been up and down AAA. So like they, they might just have this edge to them that they can overcome a, a double header where multiple guys had to pitch in multiple games the day before. But they're definitely behind the eight ball. I don't think Milwaukee's the most daunting place to play. Corbin Burns isn't there anymore. So while they have the upper hand on the Mets, I think, I, I don't know if it's as much as the scenario might lead you to think. Yeah. I, I mean, I could see that, too. Um, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting week with these these two teams. Um, obviously, like you mentioned, they just saw each other over the weekend. So it's pretty much they played, got very familiar with each other. Mets had to go do a marathon, and the, Bra- the Brewers sat here and waited for them. So I, I'm just going to see how that one definitely goes. Um, yeah, I don't know. To me, the Mets are just so much scarier, though, just based off of all that juice they have going right now. Um and their familiarity with the Phillies obviously doesn't help either. I guess we'll touch on this now really quick because I think by the next time we talk, it might already be announced. But we know Zach Wheeler is going to go game one on Saturday. But game two, who is getting the ball? Uh, we know Christopher Sanchez's splits between home and road are like almost three run difference. Uh, Aaron Nola looked a lot better his last few starts after a rough start to September. Ranger Suarez, I do not know. Um, there's a lot of concern there. He did not look good in his final start of the regular season against the Nationals. So he's definitely out of this equation, although it looks like he might have to pitch game four if necessary, which could be a little bit of a concern. Um, what? Who, who's going game two? Because it's at home, but I, I just – don't know what their plan would be here. Uh, I don't know. I kind of like the idea of splitting up Nolan Wheeler, though. But what do you think? Yeah, I'd probably prefer Sanchez to go game two. Um, mm-hmm. Just because of, like, the home and road splits are certainly there. I kind of like the idea of going righty, lefty, righty. Um, I know the Mets or Brewers, I don't, like, follow how much they platoon guys. I know the Mets definitely pencil in J. Mark as a left and um, pull him out against righty sometimes, even though he's been struggling. Like, that's a guy who's been there, done that in the playoffs, and I don't really want to give him the chance to break out of a slump when, it, when like, it's a, you know, a closer series. So I'd rather Sanchez probably get game two. He was good in New York last start. He did walk five guys, um, so that's a little concerning. It seems like that's been one of his issues on the road, the command kind of going a bit. But he wasn't bad, and that was the one game that they won up in New York during that series, or one of the games that they won. So, like, I don't hate it if they go with him on the road, but also, like, if you take care of home field with Wheeler, who you know is going to give you a chance to win, and Sanchez, whose numbers are better, at home versus road. Like, I kind of like the idea of how Noel has been in the big spots for them the last few years. He's pitched pretty well historically up in New York, I believe. I just remember, you know, the, the consecutive strikeout record game that he had. He's had some good starts there over the last few years, and he's 
you know, contrary to your belief, he's shown tendency to show up in relatively big games um, most of the time um, when they needed, you know, clinchers or playoff starts in general against the Braves the last few years. So I don't, I don't hate him going in game three at New York, either in a tie series or with a chance to clinch on the road. Um, I'd probably feel a little bit more comfortable with Nola in a tie series than I would with Sanchez, just because we've seen him do it before in the playoffs. Whereas Sanchez was good last year, but he did get early hooks in diamond bat diamond series. So I don't really know what he looks like in the fifth or sixth inning of a big playoff game. Yeah. I- I, to me, it's more of a. I think it's more of a safety net to have Nolan Game Three, um, mm-hmm. like you mentioned. I mean, even if you know if it's tied one-one, you feel good about having him on the road versus Sanchez on the road in a Game Three. Um, if you're up 2-0, you feel pretty good about being able to end it. And if you're down 2-0, you feel like you can at least live another day uh, more with him than Sanchez. So I think you know that's what I would do. I just. I don't know if they'll do it because I think the way Rob Thompson is with these guys that it's like, oh, you know, we believe in our guys, blah, blah, blah. And they're not going to disrespect Nola by moving them back a game. I just, unfortunately, I feel like that's how they're going to operate. And I think that's a little short-sighted in thought. Yeah. I, I anticipate them to go with Nola game too, Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily, like you said, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it. Like we just talked about, but, I think, especially because he he looked okay in the New York start last week. Like I don't, I'm not going to be upset if Sanchez is the game three starter. He's been right. a horse free all year. He's going to pitch one of the first. He should pitch one of the first three games. We're we're talking about Sanchez like they're not going to jump him with Suarez. I'd mm-hmm. be shocked if they do. But Suarez does have the postseason history the last few years, and I think Sanchez's stuff definitely plays up in the bullpen which is another reason why i'd almost prefer him to go game two if you get to a potential game five um the schedule is very close together um oddly enough so like suarez end up making start or five but sanchez is 97 with sync plays a lot better in a bullpen to me than nola's you know 92 front door sinkers um sanchez came up as a bullpen guy when he got traded over from the Rays, they, they kind of looked at him as a starter and he was throwing that 97 and he couldn't command it. So they sent him down, forked on the command. He came up throwing 92 or 93. And then this year we've kind of seen it tick back up to 97, 96. Um, let's think, and he's around the zone, obviously, as we've, we've seen all year. So I just kind of like having that weapon to pull out similar to how you've used Suarez the last few years um, as that lefty out of the pen in a deeper series or a later game in this short series if you need to like one start from christopher sanchez and bullpen work is better than one start from nola and bullpen work to me just as the stuff projects yeah i i, I totally get that and understand and agree yeah i i don't know it's gonna be interesting i guess thursday friday we'll figure this out uh we'll see what they go with but yeah we'll be back later in the week when we know who the phillies will face starting on saturday um go a little more in depth on that and hopefully, uh, I don't know, hopefully it's good. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. But, uh, yeah, keep an eye on Mets and Brewers because that is who, the winner of that is who the Phillies will face on Saturday.